Terrific uh, to be with you today uh, for this event on shaping the future of rural and remote health. I'm Tony Capon, a Professor of Planetary Health at Monash University, where I also direct the Monash Sustainable Development Institute. As I get started, I'd really like to acknowledge the traditional owners of our country. Here in Melbourne, uh, that's the Kulin people, uh, and of course, wherever you are around Australia or indeed around the world, we should acknowledge the traditional owners. It's very relevant to what I'm gonna be talking about now, this idea of planetary health and what it means for the future of rural and remote health. In this talk, I'd like to do three things. First, tell you about the Rockefeller Foundation Lancet Commission on Planetary Health. Secondly, explore the value of human ecology to understand human health. And then the so what? What does all this mean for the future of rural and remote health? The Lancet Commission on Planetary Health was first convened in 2014, and we published our report in 2015. That report was called Safeguarding Human Health in the Anthropocene Epoch. This new geological epoch in which humans are now changing natural systems, changing the earth to such an extent that we'll see it in the fossil record. You can see a list here of the commissioners involved in the Planetary Health Commission. They weren't all health people. Uh, I was part of that because at the time, I was directing the UNU, United Nations University Global Health Institute. But the commissioners came from a variety of disciplines and from various regions of the world. And notably, as you'll see on this slide, the commission report built on previous work, including the work of the IPCC on uh, climate change and health, the work of the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, looking at ecosystems and human well-being, uh, the One Health approach, human health, animal health, and the environments, eco health, which is very much about ecosystems and their importance for human health, and notably also the Brundtland Commission in the mid 1980s. Uh, the Brundtland Commission report. Uh, Our Common Future was published in 1987. And it's worth remembering that uh, Gro Brundtland, who chaired that commission, was trained as a medical doctor before she went on to be Prime Minister of Norway and to chair that commission. So the vision of sustainable development, which came from that report, in the 1980s was very much founded in ideas of development that won't harm prospects for future generations, won't harm the health and well-being of future generations. Of course, we can go further back with that historical lens on Hippocrates in ancient Greece more than 2000 years ago. He was writing books like this on airs, waters and places. So Hippocrates, uh, considered the father of modern medicine, the Hippocratic Oath, of course, important in medicine, Hippocrates was talking to his patients. He was thinking about how they lived, where they lived, and what those circumstances meant for their health and well-being. He was making ecological deductions, if you like, without uh, the benefit of modern medicine and modern technologies. He was listening to his patients. He was thinking about their circumstances. And of course, indigenous people, uh, where I started this talk, Waiora, which is a Maori word for well-being and healthy waters, was the theme of last year's International Health Promotion Conference in Rotorua and New Zealand. And it was focused on this idea of planetary health and sustainable development. And the organizers chose that word and to showcase indigenous knowledge because for all indigenous people, 
these ideas of planetary health are central uh, to spiritual understandings and indeed contemporary cultural practice. So planetary health might be a new term in academia, in medical journals, uh, in health research, but it's not a new idea for Indigenous people. We can learn a lot from the way Indigenous people think about their health and its relationship to country, uh, that these things are entirely interconnected. So what do we find uh, in the Commission's work and uh, what did we report uh, when we wrote in the journal? Well, one thing we found was that by almost any measure, the human population is healthier now than ever before. And here, data from the World Bank in 2011, uh, life expectancy data, you can see here that uh, uh, from the left in 1960, uh, through to 2010, this 50-year period, that black line in the middle is the world average life expectancy. So during that 50 years, it rose from the low 50s uh, right through to the high 60s, and it's now in the low 70s. So uh, throughout that period, uh, we've seen a very significant increase in life expectancy, and you can see uh, when it's disaggregated by region, that this occurred in all regions of the world. Notably though, uh, there remain very significant uh, urban health inequities, uh, health inequities more generally in uh, Africa and South Central and West Asia. Our other main finding was that in achieving those health gains, we've exploited the planet at an unprecedented rate. Escalating carbon dioxide emissions, uh, ocean acidification, energy use, global deforestation, water use, fertilizer use, the list goes on. So what is planetary health? Put simply, planetary health is the health of human civilization and the state of the natural systems on which it depends. And what are those relationships between environment and health? The Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, which I mentioned before, presented this schema 15 years ago, and it remains very useful. On the left side of the figure, we can see escalating human pressures on the global environment. In the middle there, a list of environmental changes and ecosystem impairments, whether it's climate change, stratospheric ozone depletion, forest clearance, right through to urbanization, damage to coral reefs and ecosystems. And then on the right, uh, examples of health effects, whether they're the direct health effects of these changes, ecosystem mediated in the middle, or indirect, deferred and displaced health effects. So the direct effects are pretty straightforward. We know that climate extremes, weather extremes, uh, cause harms to health whether it's the people that die in floods, heat waves, uh, other extreme weather events. In the middle there, ecosystem mediated health effects include alterations to infectious disease risk. For example, uh, the changing uh, distribution and abundance of mosquito vectors will affect the, uh, the risk of vector-borne diseases. And we're seeing that uh, with dengue fever, for example, in this country and around the world, and with malaria, uh, where that remains a major problem. Notably down the bottom, those indirect deferred and displaced health effects are often the most significant. And a good example in Australia would be the prolonged drought uh, that we're emerging from in some places at the moment, but where we can only anticipate it will continue uh, to be a major uh, health problem, uh, climate derived uh, uh, for this country. So for example, in rural areas, Australia, uh, particularly where there's agricultural production is a major source uh, of uh, income uh, with a prolonged drought, of course, we see drying of soil. We see um, uh, as a result of that, uh, declines in incomes 
of farming families. And this has the potential for very significant effects on mental health and well-being, and indeed on broader community well-being. So in the commission, we explored uh, the interconnections between these environmental changes too. So when we're thinking about the future of food availability and quality around the world, it's not just climate change, as I just mentioned, but it's also land degradation and soil erosion, water scarcity more generally, loss of pollinators, uh, overfishing and ocean acidification. And emerging infectious diseases are very topical this year, of course, uh, with the global pandemic. So whether it's this new coronavirus that's emerged in China or previously H5N1 and SARS in this region, in the African region, uh, Ebola, in the Americas, uh, Zika. These emerging infectious diseases arise in the context of a changing climate, uh, loss of forest, loss of biodiversity, urbanization, and new opportunities for contact between wild animals and people with spillover of emerging infections. But it's important to remember that in this commission report, we had a positive message. It's not all doom and gloom. While we face enormous challenges, we can meet them. We know enough to act, we just need to get on with it. So to come back to food production and agriculture, we already know many of the things that we need to do to meet increased food requirements around the world. Here projections of total uh, global cereal production that we'll need in the years ahead to meet demand. And you can see on the left, the range of strategies that we already know about from sustainable intensification uh, through uh, support for subsistence farmers to reduce food waste. And that's a really important one because at the moment, nearly 30% of the world's total agricultural land is being used to produce food that's never eaten. And so clearly, if we address um, our food waste, uh, we'll have more food to share around the world. In our country, uh, food is often thrown out uh, from the table or indeed even from the fridge without even making it to the table. In uh, low-income countries, it may well spoil uh, before it even gets uh, to the table uh, because of problems with food, uh, uh, transport and storage, lack of refrigeration, for example, uh, but also um, uh, vermin. And the importance of forest conservation more generally, because it can reduce disease risks. Here's some examples from the Brazilian Amazon, the way that malaria transmission can be reduced in the context of forest conservation, the way acute respiratory infections are reduced with forest conservation, the way diarrheal disease rates are reduced in the context of forest conservation. And finally, family planning. More than 200 million women around the world want to avoid pregnancy, but are not currently using effective contraception. And providing access to that family planning could cut maternal death rates by around 30%. Meeting the needs for modern contraception in low-income countries would only cost us about $5 billion per year. That's a relatively small proportion of the global development budget. But clearly there are political reasons um, uh, why this isn't happening. And then the circular economy. In the end, uh, we have to rethink, reimagine our economic model, moving from a high consumption, wasteful model uh, to one that focuses on reuse, repair and recycling. So our final conclusions from the Commission report that were solutions do lie within reach, but require a redefinition of prosperity to focus on quality of life and improved health for all, together with respect for the integrity of natural systems. We identified three broad categories of challenges. The first we called conceptual. Uh, we might think of them as failures of imagination. 
And uh, in many countries, we continue to measure progress by monitoring GDP. And that just doesn't make good sense because it's really a measure of economic activity. As health people, we need to be arguing that we want to bring measures of human health and well-being into these measures of progress and importantly, measures of the state of the environment for a genuine progress measure. Secondly, the governance challenges, failures of implementation. And a good example of this is in Australia and other countries at the moment, we tend to focus our governmental decisions on what works for the voters, uh, what works for people currently alive in the world. But in Wales, in the United Kingdom, in 2015, they enacted new legislation called the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. And that requires their elected officials to think about the implications of their new policies for the well-being of future generations. That's a big shift and it's important if we're to achieve planetary health. Finally, a note about research and information challenges, failures of knowledge, if you like. And uh, we made a case, a strong case for transdisciplinary research and indeed education. And by this, we mean an approach that brings together a range of academic disciplines, but transcends them and values the know-how of local communities and of indigenous people, bringing that together so we can learn together. So here's a link to that commission report. And on that website, there are a range of other materials that you may find useful, including video material. As I finish, I'd like to say a few words about the importance of human ecology as a way of understanding patterns of human health, the need to bring human ecology alongside epidemiology as a core method in rural and remote health. And here I refer to the work of the eminent human ecologist, Stephen Boydham, and one of his books, The Biology of Civilization, Understanding Human Culture as a Force in Nature. In most of our health research, uh, whether it's rural health, remote health, urban health, we're talking about human activities, the things that people are doing and what that means for their health. We often talk about behavioral risk factors to understand what might go wrong with people's health. We also talk about social determinants of health, the sort of safety nets, for example, that we might put in place to keep people healthy. Yeah. But we haven't paid as much attention in recent times to the way those same human activities, the things we're doing in society, affect the health of the planet, the health of the environment, whether it's climate, biodiversity, ecosystems more generally. This has tended to be the purview of environmental scientists, but health scientists need to understand the implications of these environmental changes for health. And we might call these ecological determinants. So we need to bring these alongside the social determinants for an eco-social approach. And indeed, remember uh, that we need to think in a more systematic way, is there are feedbacks in this system. So this work comes, as I said, from the work of Stephen Boyden, the human ecologist, and here's a link uh, to another of his books. You can download that. Uh, for free on the ANU website. So my final slide, what does all this mean for rural and remote health? How should we respond? Well, the first point to emphasize is that we need to bring a focus on intergenerational health equity into the way we do our work. We're getting better at focusing on health equity uh, through the work of the social developments uh, social determinants, uh, folk like Michael Marmot and others, but we're yet to bring the ecological back in, uh, like Hippocrates did all those years ago, but we need to re-embrace that. Secondly, we need this eco-social approach that I mentioned before, an approach that recognises the ecological, economic and social foundations. Thirdly, systems thinking critical in this complex and changing world. Fourth, to re-emphasize the value of indigenous and local knowledge. 
planetary health is not a new idea for Indigenous people. And the final message, perhaps a summary message, is that we need to bring a planetary consciousness to rural and remote uh, health research, uh, training, policy and practice. Thanks very much.